going from your right uh, to, to left, uh, I'll introduce. Um, April Kroner uh, specializes in planning and community economic development. Uh, she has 20 years of experience, including working with both the public and private sector, uh, ranging from land use planning, downtown revitalization, and business development to economic, environmental policy and site acquisition and design. Um, she is a certified planner with the American Institute of Certified Planners and currently serves as planning and development director for the city of Ashland. Uh, Stephanie Erdman uh, has a PhD in business administration and management uh, from North of Central University and is business divisional dean at Wisconsin Indian Head Technical College. She has worked in higher education for 15 years in private, technical, and tribal college settings. Uh, she also owns a consulting firm, 3E Guided Solutions, and has completed projects for the administration for Native Americans, um, a department within Health and Human Services, uh, uh, U.S. government, for the Menominee Tribe and various small businesses and agribusiness in rural Wisconsin. Uh, Rick Dale is an entrepreneur, farmer, um, and enterprise development specialist. Uh, he is also the founder and president of the family-owned and operated Highland Val Valley Farm, incorporated in Bayfield. Uh, he's been a resident of the community for 40 years and has served as an elected official in municipal government and served on numerous public and private boards and committees. For a five-year period, he directed agricultural programs for WITC at its national campus. Um, Paul Demain is a member of the United Nation of Wisconsin and of Ojibwe descent. He and Seven Stock Partners operate a business incubator office building on the Lacoudere Ojibwe Reservation near Hayward, Wisconsin where he helps publish the monthly newspaper News from Indian Country, copies of which are and produces video for IndianCountryTV.com. Uh, he also serves on several foreign nonprofit organizations, including um, chairing the board of directors for the Navajo Times Publishing Company um, uh, in Arizona, New York, Arizona. And Scott Griffiths is the homegrown, uh, raised in Ashland mayor of Washburn. Um, after a decade of exploring the country in his 20s and 30s, he moved back to Washburn with his wife Kelly in 2009. Uh, he and Kelly opened the area's first dedicated yoga studio, Humblebee, in 2010. And uh, that business has since, since been passed on to a new owner. Um, but he also dabbles in small business endeavors, uh, ranging from the arts to the trades, and currently owns and manages two related e-commerce websites serving people around the world that study West African percussion, another hobby of his since 2001. So uh, I've abbreviated your bios briefly in the interest of time, so don't uh, pull that against me. Uh, but uh, April, why don't we start with you? And I will say, in the interest of time, I, having been cut off many times myself in public speaking situations, I'm not afraid to do the same. So. <laughs> keep, keep the uh, uh, five minutes or so. Uh, the questions, okay? Well, we can keep it under five minutes. <laughs> um, let's see, what are the challenges uh, related to community and economic development? Um, in my current position or in other positions, um, I guess probably one of the Biggest challenges I experienced. We need to mic it. We can't hear very well. Is there a mic? We're just going to have to speak up. Yes, I'll just have to You can come up here if you want to get a talk. Yeah, yeah that's all right. Much <laughs> <laughs> more comfortable up here. Um, I think one of the biggest things that, that I'm running into is um, maybe some resistance to change um, from the local government side of things. It's, a lot of we've always done it this way, this is a whole new approach and it's hard to really um, get that sold to not only elected officials but people in the community. They're, they're maybe a little bit afraid to try something different. They maybe are, you know, understand that it doesn't always work the way things were done before but it's worked good enough, we're not ready to 
to try something that innovative, that new. So I think that's probably the biggest piece <coughs> that I'm seeing challenge with is just trying to get people to embrace this and give it a try and take that chance. So. So the challenge. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. I mean, if you want to, if you want to, you don't have to just talk. I mean, you can talk about other stuff too. Okay. Weather challenges, whatever. Free range. Okay, I'll talk <laughs> using my teacher voice. <laughs> so uh, some of the challenges that are related to community and economic development that I've seen has been over the last 15 years or so. And initially the challenge was a very homogenous group of people, while very well intentioned, lacking a diverse perspective on what's needed within our community. So often it was professionals or current business owners, um, typically males, often over the age of 55. And it was a very narrow focus group. Again, very well intentioned, but not necessarily having that broad view. So what's been nice to see over the last 10 years is women owned businesses, minority owned businesses, youth getting involved with um, what they want to see in their community and really going after a community perspective. And it's been powerful in working in small communities. Well, I assumed that I was asked to be a part of this to speak to agriculture. Um, and so that's what I prepared for. Uh, I'm gonna read this and it won't take five minutes, uh, just to keep myself on, uh, on track here. There's so much that we could talk about. And uh, I'll read this, but then hopefully during the questions I can speak more off the cuff. But it, what I have to tell you may strike a nerve here and there, and you'll have an opportunity to, to test me and uh, we'll seek some clarification. Locally produced food has become a tenant in the planning groups, in the planning of groups and individuals who are concerned for restored, healthy, and sustainable rural economies. However, I believe there is a disconnect in our thinking regarding both the realities and the possibilities for the contribution of agriculture to the local rural economy. The reality is that very little economically viable agricultural enterprise remains in, in Bayfield and Ashland County. That is, enterprise with the capacity to provide even a median income for the farmer. The possibility <coughs> of renewed viable agriculture, local agriculture enterprise, is often self-limited in our planning efforts by small thinking, by ignorance, by unrealistic expectations arising from the present state of our disconnection from farm enterprise. The industrialization of American agriculture is now nearly complete. Many rural communities have been severely impacted as a result. And farmers now represent less than 1% of the national population. 75% of national food production is produced by only 9% of American farmers. Of the 91% of the farms that the USDA categorizes as small farms, 60% represent sales of less than $10,000 annually and a net income loss of $4,500. 91% small farms, 60% losing $4,500 a year. The wealth of American ag agriculture, which was once broadly distributed among many producers on farms averaging less than 300 acres each, is now concentrated in the hands of very few, very big, often absentee farm operators. The threat of the CAFO is not just to the water quality of a sacred body of water. It also threatens the economic health of rural agricultural communities like our own by displacing smaller farmers, depleting rural populations, and weakening the local uh, institutions and infrastructures that support family farms. That is not to say that middle-sized resident owner-operated family farms cannot be viable. Bigger is not necessarily better. 
Most of the economic efficiency gain realized by increasing economy of scale is captured by the moderate sized family farm. And if resource com uh, con consumption, if resource consumption is the standard over cost of production, it has been demonstrated that industrial farm consumption of resources per unit of production rises as the industrial farm factory grows even larger. But family farms, in significant numbers, will not be restored in our rural economy of 30,000 residents through a bilocal program, as much as I will support it. At 245 pounds of dairy product, the current national per capita consumption of milk, three family farms, modest family farms, milking 100 cows each, would supply the entire two county annual need of 7,350,000 pounds of milk. My point is that farms need to be able to export to more densely populated urban communities. Cities exist because agriculture came into being. We need to export to denser populated communities if our rural community and our farms are to remain viable or become viable and our cities are to survive. We have here the available land, natural resources to produce, to bring wealth from outside into our local economy. Agriculture was once the economic backbone of, Bayfield, of the Bayfield County economy. Over time, it could become a larger contributor again. What will be required in my mind is first and foremost, people with the desire and the will to stay put. We need to commit to this place. Farming is a long-term proposition with a, and a lifelong vocation. To save what production we already have, we need to assist existing farms to be able to transition to the next generation. That's a whole discussion. Beginning at home, this is values. Beginning at home, we need to stop denigrating this place where we live by convincing our children that their future opportunities for vocation and fulfillment will be better found somewhere else. And we don't get that by making them feel ashamed of being sons and daughters of farmers. That needs to change, and it's an attitude, and it begins at home. Beyond that, without getting too off the record here, <laughs> off the rails, so to speak, but I am passionate about these issues, is that uh, we need to return and strengthen agricultural programming in our schools to include, and it should include, agricultural entrepreneurialism. Why? Because we have lost it and we need to rebuild it. It will take a new generation of farmers who will not have the mentoring of a generation ahead of them because they are gone. So we need farmer and entrepreneurs and it needs to begin early and it needs to be part of our public education system. The existing family farms that have survived the assault of industrialization and more recent farms in our community that have uh, established and proven themselves provide the best models for sustainability. Look to them. We need to support cooperative efforts as the best means for growing farms. Our concept of local food production for a local population necessarily must be stretched to allow local farmers to seek additional markets beyond their own hometowns and county lines. As much as farming should be a lifestyle, it must also be a business as farmers, their families, and their rural communities are to survive and prosper. Thank you.
I was more than five, but you, you typed it out, so I got you. You didn't run out. Go ahead. I'll, I'll gladly see two minutes to have him finish that up. <laughs> uh, certainly, uh, I come from a community that has plentiful labor uh, sources and, and, and people who want to work and uh, millions of dollars of available resources in, regar in, in regards to uh, reserved resources that uh, the Ojibwe communities and reservations, those reserved areas, uh, save for themselves. So it's always perplexing that uh, it just seems like we're unable to put those resources to work to the benefit of our community. Uh, I agree that uh, we, we need to uh, help create a community in which our young people feel inclined to say that they want to, uh, they don't ever want to leave. And if they do leave for an education or for other purposes, that they want to come back and continue on in the future. But the challenges in our community are very simple at times. It's just finding those resources for the ideas to put people uh, uh, to work and to implement those ideas, uh, getting simple answers uh, from tribal government uh, is, is difficult as much as the Im infrastructure is there. And you would think that uh, with uh, tribal governments and governments in general being there to provide assistance, uh, that there would be a, a path to be able to achieve uh, one's dreams. But uh, people in our community have a hard time writing a business plan. They come in with ideas, they don't know where to go. Uh, they don't own checking accounts. Uh, I, I do business uh, at a business incubator at the Couture that has uh, six businesses in it now. I write checks on a regular basis to people who are harvesters, who are crafters, and they ask the question, where can I cash this check? Don't you have an account somewhere? No, it's, it's simple uh, economic tools that uh, a lot of them don't have. Uh, they, they don't have any idea what their credit rating is, uh, if they even thought they had one. Uh, my son came home, uh, got dropped off after uh, working at the home of uh, probably one of the uh, top uh, 10 uh, asset owners in Surrey County, uh, a very uh, rich family that, uh, that has done a lot of things in our community, but we engaged in a discussion on the porch where we had uh, some other tribal members uh, uh, drying wild onions recently. And we segued into a little thing. I says, you don't understand how expensive it is to be poor. You know, and he didn't, he says, I don't know what you're talking about. What do you mean it's expensive to be poor? You know, uh, well, when you went and bought that $12,000 car, you paid $12,000, I'm pretty sure. But when my son went to get that $12,000 car, he ended up after six years paying $18,000. His credit rating was already higher because his mom and dad didn't have trust funds and other assets, so he paid a, even a higher interest rate on the mortgage to his home. It's very expensive being poor. It was kind of like an eye-opening situation to this individual about how easy in the world he had it in, in, in many cases. So some of that is just connecting our community with other people in the community that have these assets and ideas and putting them to work. We have a hard time getting things into the proper market. You know, we're talking about how uh, this area used to be a, a breadbasket to other high density areas and yet at this time, we're allowing other companies to ship in stuff from who knows where in the world. We don't know what it is, we don't know if it's healthy, we don't know how long it's been. Uh, be, been traveled, how expensive it has been, how much oil it used for transportation costs as we fight some of these negative environmental impacts. So we need to be able to figure out how to get our products. Uh, how many people have bought uh, stuff at trinket prices from indigenous producers? Because we can't get our products to the place where they can get the highest value. And so uh, those are just some of the, the little challenges. I want to leave it at that for right now. Thank you. My head feels about this big right now. Um, I know that a lot of you have probably seen some of the, the, the talks that I gave when I was working with the Alliance for Sustainability on the Audacity Project. Um, some of you 
most notably I hear often about the shovel, the shovel uh, analogy that I gave about producing shovels here instead of uh, shipping shovels in from elsewhere and, and sending the money away. Uh, so challenges, one of the challenges um, that, I, that I see is the mentality that all development is good development. Um, it, 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 it's a it's an old it's an old model that has seen its time and it's time for that model to go away. Um, and so the understanding that that just because a new developer wants to move to the region does not mean that that's going to be good and beneficial to our communities. Things um, so one of the challenges, for instance, I uh, there was a, a dollar store that wanted to move into Washburn, and when I heard that that was the case, I tried to propose a uh, a formula business ordinance. It would be an ordinance that would make it more challenging for a corporate owned entity to establish a business in the city limits. And even the business community within Washburn had trouble understanding how that was going to benefit us as a small community. Now we're a community right now in the city of Washburn that has almost zero uh, corporate owned entities. Almost every business in the city of Washburn is owned by a local family. And that, with the, with the exception of the Holiday Gas Station, which is owned by a very, very small company, a very small local company that I think has maybe six or eight different Holiday Gas Stations around the region. So that's not even, that's not, even that is not the scale that we often see. But when a dollar store that's owned by a company in Tennessee wants to come and compete with our local retailers and they're using their corporate owned buying power to be able to compete with our local retailers with no ownership stake in our community, with no uh, understanding or, or desire to be part of our community. They just want to extract. Those models are extractive. It's just like mining. It's just like industrial farming. They extract money out of our communities. The only reason they want to be here is to siphon money away. And so I think that that's one of the pieces of mentality that I think is really important for our communities to understand is that not all forms of development are good development. Will it generate property tax revenue? Certainly. Will the new quick trips in Ashland, will they generate property tax revenue? Absolutely. Will they provide some jobs? Yes, they will. Are they good, solid economic development? I think that that has yet to be determined. And I would venture a guess to say, I don't think so. They are going to be putting other businesses out of business or taking business away. It's just a zero-sum game that moves resources from one to another, and it will generate property tax revenue, but it's not necessarily good development. I think we need to be very careful about how we choose what types of development that we want to see. So that's one of the challenges that I see. Um, and just very briefly, I want to say that when, when, when I was watching Sarah give her talk up there, talking about ESOPs, co-ops, social enterprises, municipal ownership, almost everything that she spoke about there, to put into context, we have literally all of those things happening here right now. And I think it's really important when you watch that presentation, if you don't have that language or part of that as part of your vocabulary, it can look very overwhelming. So four or five years ago when I watched that, I would have been overwhelmed with information, but I can put all of those pieces into a local context that shows um, how those things are already happening here. And um, so I, I think that might help put that into some, some good, solid perspective for everyone. Well, thank you all for your comments. Um, what I envision for the question period is feel free to ask questions to Sarah or any of our panelists, uh, but I may pass your question around to other panelists as I see fit, I, after all, am the moderator, so <laughs> I'm in power. Uh, any questions? Yes, please. We have a couple of businesses in Washburn that are at risk because uh, the people need to retire. One is our local pharmacy, which is an invaluable resource, serves the whole upper peninsula, and he cannot attract someone. How could we go about providing a different kind of ownership so that a young, right out of pharmacy school graduate who would rather work for a corporation with benefits rather than become an entrepreneur, how could we form some sort of 
cooperative or other type of ownership to support that necessary business. And there's actually a, a model of exactly that happening um, in a small island off the coast of Maine, um, Deer, Deer Island off the coast of Maine. Their pharmacy, uh, the owner of the local pharmacy was retiring um, and they didn't want to lose the pharmacy, so they converted it to employee ownership. Um, there were, it wasn't a small, it wasn't a big pharmacy, but there were five to ten employees and, and they um, took over uh, ownership of that. They worked with an organization called Coastal Enterprises Inc., which is the CD, CDC, CFI that serves that region, um, and worked with them closely to go through that conversion process. Um, so it kept the jobs, it kept the, the business um, in the community. You know, how do you appeal to uh, employees to want to do that? Um, you know, that's that's a that will vary by community. Um, uh, I think it really helps to have employees that are committed to the place that want to be there. Um, and I know you're not always going to have that, and you can't necessarily always compete with uh, a, a large chain or uh, um, benefits that come with that. Al although you can show that there there are higher retention rates, there are higher sort of sharing of benefits among workers in, in, in cooperative owned firms. So you can use those kinds of statistics to, you know, it won't be immediate when you convert, but it is something that you can build towards um, that can be lasting. So there are there are studies that show this, there are examples where this has been done, it's been successful, um, but it always does help to, to have someone, uh, an employee who's willing to take that on um, and champion that. So you might not always have that, but, but you can in, inculcate it sometimes. So, and there are examples of that having worked before. Thank you. That was at Washburn? Yes. Scott, do you want to comment at all on how you might attack that? Uh, uh, I've spent a lot of, of fair amount of time we're talking to Mr. Langford about that particular issue, and, and there's some other specific challenges. It's a very small pharmacy, even smaller than five or six employees, and, and there's a lot of uh, systemic challenges within the pharmaceutical industry that make it incredibly challenging for a pharmacy of that size to compete. Um, so it's, it's, it's something that is actively being worked on, um, but, it, it, but it, does, it does present some challenges uh, right down to the fact of finding a pharmacist that will even move to the region um, to, because it's not something that can just be handed over. There was a pharmacist here who had trouble getting her license based on another one. And so there's all sorts of specific factors with that particular instance, but hopefully we can still make that one. And also keep an independent grocery store. Well, and that's another, so that is specifically where I was talking about where an ESOP is in consideration. Uh, spoken with the owners and with the current, with some of the current employees to look at an ESOP um, uh, transition of our locally owned grocery store. Because other than that, the, the opportunity for the grocery store owners is to sell to a larger chain. And and we, I know I for one am hoping that that doesn't that, that doesn't happen. That we maintain the local ownership. I think this is one of the big pieces that. that uh, Someone that, that Sarah works with, a woman named Marjorie Keller, who wrote a book called Ownership, uh, Owning, our, Owning Future. our Future. Yeah. And so I think that the, the consideration of ownership models is so key to understanding that if it's not owned by people who live here, then all the surplus and profits leave. And, and that is, it's, it's, until that becomes part of the local consciousness of understanding that local ownership is a critical piece to maintaining and developing wealth in our local communities, we're going to continue to run into these, these challenges, so. And I, and I would say that based on what's the discussion here, that's probably one of the biggest challenges in our community. How to make people realize how their money works in the local community. At Lakota Ray, there used to be three locally owned grocery stores by members that lived out in those communities and they're all gone. And you would think that Walmart was an Indian community center now. <laughs> <laughs> you go to the 1950s and the anthropologists say every single household 
had a garden. There was four or five different dairy farms on the reservation where people got uh, their milk and their eggs and other things. Everything was in that community and very self-sufficient at one point. Even though it was poor, it was very vibrant. Now it's poor and all the activity leaves the reservation. Well, you got a lot of casino money. And what does it do? It flows out of the community very, very rapidly because it doesn't do anything within the internal community. And it's not by accident that Walmarts are located right on the edges of most Indian mm -hmm. reservations. And this is, these are very intentional strategies. Um, so. And poor communities. And poor communities, absolutely. Hello, Brother. Uh, thanks. Sarah, I've dealt with the ESOP programs myself, and they are very, very tricky. And one of the keys, and I can kind of think that this is happening in Washburn. One of the keys. It's not happening yet. A conversation is being started. Uh, the problem. <laughs> one of the keys is lack of money or lack of funding, lack of money on behalf of owned by the employees, the potential owners. That's a real issue. It's nationwide in my industry. There's been big studies. That's is there any, in your experience, is there any government, I hate to think about government funding, but here we go. Is there any government funding, state or federal, that would go into some sort of loan program or something for potential employee owners? So there's a lot of thought about that. Um, I can't think of a single example yet, but I know that there is a, a fair amount of discussion around it. NCEO, the National Center for Employee Ownership in the Bay Area, is, is doing work on that, as is a group called Project Equity that's working on conversion. Um, and so they're, they're thinking about those kinds of loan products and revolving loan funds to incentivize that. Um, I know exactly what you're talking about in terms of ESOP conversion and, right. and how that can be, particularly in terms of tax consequences, uh, a real burden yeah. for employees, especially low-income employees. Um, so one of the organizations we're working with uh, uh, on Pine Ridge is Native American Natural Foods, and they have converted to employee ownership. They're a for-profit company, um, and they've converted to employee ownership, but an ESOP model did not work for them. Right. Uh, largely because um, a lot of their employees are low-income um, uh, tribal members who have uh, who receive government benefits, and um, the conversion would impact them in a, in a tax way and also hurt their ability to access those benefits. So what they chose to do instead was do a limited liability corporation where they now have I think a five or ten percent share. Um, that's that's set aside exclusively for employees. Um, so there are different forms, and, and I mentioned hybrid forms, and you're starting to see more of those kinds of experiments so as to avoid those kinds of consequences, especially for employees. ESOPs, because of those kinds of impacts, are generally a better model for, for a large scale sort of um, mid-level employment, uh, you know, professionalist, um, yeah. uh, model. So, so you're starting to see some some experiments with different forms like LC3s and things like that. So, so it's really new, and I don't have super pinpoint examples I can tell you, but but people are thinking through it. Yeah. Thank you. Something that Paul said really struck a chord, and we moved up here from Racine when we raised our kids about 14 years ago, and I was very active in Wisconsin Women Entrepreneurs. And I see what you stated as terms of people not knowing where to go for a loan, not knowing how to write a business plan, not knowing what an LTE or is or LC or you know how to do it. So we started a very informal group, just talked our, called ourselves Women at Work, and all we were is women who met for 12, uh, 12 of us maybe, or whoever wanted to come and talked about how you do these things and asked the questions and one helped another and it was marvelous. We even had a waitress at the old good time before a burn who said, can I do this? Can I listen? And she ended up starting a business. Um, and when we went to the Rise Breakfast, which many of you attended, I, I kept thinking of that in our brainstorming at our table we were talking about that people need 
some of the real basics that aren't, it isn't a, a, a score thing or a WITC class. It's just sitting around and sharing that information and helping one another. And I still believe that we spawned three businesses. Well, maybe one is still exists and one turned into something else, but you know, just that little effort. And in, in terms of what you said, Rick, that the, I, I, when you're talking about the farm and so forth and the values, it reminded me so much of being at Jimmy Erickson's orchard during Apple Fest. And he is starting something alternative to Apple Fest that goes back to the farms and goes back to being at the farm and eating the apples at the farm, not buying all the schlock, just finding the reality. And I think both of those things are extreme. In the early days, the Bayfield Apple Festival really was the farmers. And if there were food booths on the street, most of them were the Girl Scouts, the Brownies, the, the local church groups, um, township uh, social organizations. There was very little out of town uh, booth on the street. It was a much smaller operation, but a much larger share. People come with X number of dollars to spend at the Apple Fest. Before, they maybe had 35 choices of where they spent their money and now how many do they have. And most of those people collecting the money are leaving town as soon as the uh, parade's over on Sunday. And now they're spending it on parking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I, can I just speak to this uh, thing about, uh, not ESO, but uh, in, in a rural setting, uh, you know, microfinance, and, and as was said, we aren't the exact model with the, you know, the medium-sized business with uh, a, 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 a mass, a critical mass of employees that can buy in to make this company, to sustain this company and keep it in the community. And, and so, but to help modest uh, entrepreneurial startup and effort, uh, every township should have a growth incentive. We, we, we have one at Bayfield. It, it, it's very little known. Uh, maximum loan is $7,500 and you get a first signature. You know, it's a one-page application. And uh, it's a revolving loan fund. Uh, we have helped innumerable uh, uh, startups uh, and existing farms in, in Bayfield County, and I think it's one of the reasons why uh, there's some vibrancy there. Not a big reason, but a contributing reason. Yeah. My son is starting a winery. Well, you will hear about it next year. But he's got it in the stainless steel tanks, and it's fermenting now. But there will be a big announcement. And he went to the Growth Incentive Fund because he needed rootstock to do more than just berries in his winery. And, he, and, and last week he planted a, a vineyard of Marquette grapes. And he was reaching beyond what he had, you know, it, it, it's capital intensive, a lot of stainless steel and all of that. But if the growth incentive fund had been there, he would have run out of resources as far as, as being able to plant grapes this summer. But he's got his vineyard in place and, and the growth incentive fund has had that impact. I'm a trustee, so I, I really can't tell you about <laughs> some of our other uh, uh, farmers who have benefited that you would know them, and they are exciting uh, entrepreneurial ventures. Well, can I, uh, I was just going to, if uh, other panelists wanted to talk about uh, sort of entrepreneurial ventures that have risen out of, say, your incubator, uh, Paul, or something? Well, we, the, part of it was just having the building available on the reservation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, people showed up with ideas and uh, some possibilities, and there's been a couple of failures, as, as you would see uh, with small entrepreneurs. Uh, but we've had a computer repair shop that started there in the back little corner and grew into the front and had to take more space, and eventually they bought their own place down the road and opened up and, and went out. So part of it is, is just having uh, available space in, in a location that typically doesn't have hardly anything. 
just the presence of the building that's there draw, draws people. And uh, you don't find many office buildings with available rental space on Indian reservations sitting around. Maybe at Oneida River, <coughs> but, but, but not at Bad River and Red Cliff and, and other places. So part of it is, is uh, I spent all, you know I spent a tremendous amount of time doing all kinds of things all over the country in terms of nonprofits and profits and businesses and everything. But I spend probably once a month sitting down with someone who wants to draft out their ideas, wants to go look for some money. Uh, like I said, I got a guy sitting on the front porch now who's drying out wild onions and pulverizing them, and he made a, a, a maple and wild onion. Uh, mix here together and glazed his venison ribs, he wants to get all that out of the market somehow, someday. You know, but there's a lot of barriers having to do with a certified USDA kitchen. All your stainless steel stuff that you gotta go through to get it on the market. And so far, he's given most of his product away to friends and relatives coming around, which is another issue in the Indian community. You know, we love feeding each other, and so he's in, a, in an industry, but I think if he gets momentum, there's other people around him who, who uh, will feed into them. Yeah. Uh, so my my vision for a local community and economic development is for a very collaborative approach that involves perspectives of all of the community members, including the business owners and the angel investors, the youth, and others who are invested in that community, and that collaborative nature comes from the work that I've done with tribes uh, in the past. I was at the College of Menominee Nation, a tribal college on the Menominee Reservation, for over 10 years. And in that time, I had a lot of opportunities to be involved in uh, economic development of the reservation. And the main thing that we did, and we did very well, was to develop a strategic plan. And it took over two years to complete this project because every single person on the reservation and off the reservation who wanted to be involved, um, the tribal members, the descendants, and the community members were involved in developing this plan for what that reservation was going to look like. So we focused on the health of the people, we focused on education, as well as the economy. And it was a long process, um, but the results were phenomenal. So now the tribe has an alternative high school, ensuring that everyone on the reservation earns a high school diploma. They've identified the types of businesses that were needed on the reservation. So the tribe built a strip mall, secured a grocery store, a convenience store, and a subway restaurant. They've made space for a laundromat, but no entrepreneurs so far has wanted to take on that. That, but the space is there for planning. Um, as for health, the main health issues were identified with diabetes being the number one health issue. And uh, the clinic worked very hard on the health of the community, a lot of initiatives. And last year in 2015, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Culture of Health Award was given to the Menominee Tribe for their work. So what, um, I, I love the philosophy that I got to be involved with on the <coughs> reservation. And it's a rural community that's been struggling with keeping people there, that's been <coughs> struggling with keeping agriculture there. And it included the <coughs> concepts and the perceptions from everyone. What do you want to see your community be? What do we need here to be successful? So people who come visit this area, what do they want to see? What are you missing? identify those key things, work together to figure out who's excited about being an entrepreneur, and then match them up. Talk. The, the conversations that you're having at your tables, talk about those kinds of things. It's not about making a profit. It's not necessarily about making a profit. It's about creating a community in place. And that's why I was saying that everybody needs to be around. Sorry. Yeah, um, this area is very rich in retirees mm -hmm. who own a lot of mutual funds and stock investments with money that's held far, far away. Are there any uh, models for a local mutual fund uh, investing in the community that would 
be able to uh, you know, fund like the purchase of the grocery store, the, the pharmacy? Uh, are there models for those kind of things where people can take some of their retirement money and put it into a, you know, a legitimate mutual fund that's locally run? There are. I don't know of any, but I know as part of um, the source forum that we held last fall in Ashland, um, that was one of the things that Brandon and Brian, you were both involved in with that is, you know, definitely looking at, is there a way we can have community investment? Um, the the Washburn Grocery Store, is there a way that you can have people invest portions of their retirement into Why that? Why you get it in the co-op? Exactly, and something like that, have a fund that's set up so, you know, it's, you don't have one big purchaser coming in to do it, but everybody that says this is important to us, I want to give three thousand dollars and take all those local investments to put it in. Um, that was something that I know they were, you guys were working on and looking into. Um, Sarah, if you're familiar with with an approach like that, I mean that's something I've been thinking about too. Even in just purchasing some of the vacant buildings in our downtown and trying to get something going, is that something that they're important enough to the community? that we could set up some sort of unique way to invest in that and get something going there and help the business get off the ground. Because the community itself doesn't have funds to be giving out a lot of that. The state does not really offer a lot other than some tax credits for job creation, which isn't going to help somebody that doesn't have a lot of money to get a business start. So be interested in hearing what you So there is a model called direct public offerings, or DPO. Um, uh, it is not very widely used, but it has been used in a couple of instances, and the reason why it's not very widely used is because it varies by state by state, depending on um, regulation of investment, but uh, it, it has been used in California. Um, Market Creek Plaza was a community-owned development that was funded completely through um, direct investment from local residents uh, doing things like using their savings or retirement accounts and investing directly into um, this fund through the direct public offerings. Um, so you're starting to see that model happen in other places as well. Um, there is a lawyer, Jenny Casson, who, who structured that deal. Um, She's based uh, out of the Bay Area, and she's working to um, take that, and, and her, her group is working to take that model um, national and, and do it in other places. She's working in other states, and she's worked in Massachusetts to change regulations so that you can have direct um, uh, investment into um, this kind of uh, aggregated startup capital fund. Um, for, for local businesses. So that is one example. We're also starting to see um, things like uh, pensions being invested directly into local financial institutions. Um, if you can get large pensions to invest directly into a, a community bank, that would make a, a huge uh, difference in, in capital availability for, for local investment. So you're, you're starting to see cities think through where its uh, pension dollars are invested for its employees and do that directly. That's not something that individual employees can do, but, but, but employers can think through where their pension money is invested. So that's one example. But um, I, I'd be happy to find more resource, resources on this DPO model. Um, and then, of course, you're seeing more sort of crowdsourcing models um, happening more and more. There's a group in Seattle called Community Source Capital where individual investors can buy um, what they call a square, uh, essentially a share in, in a small um, enterprise development effort. Um, and then they, they, they uh, match make and, and guarantee those investments. So um, you're starting to see more models. They're, they're, they're not widely known um, and they're still evolving, but they're out there and um, they could be adapted. We started to do some research on how that applies locally uh, with community development funds. Um, and one of the challenges that we've, that we've run into at the, at the current moment is, is in order for a fund to reach a size that, that provides uh, enough income for the fund so that the fund can staff, meet their needs from a staffing standpoint, the fund needs to be roughly in the, in the neighborhood of $5 million, give or take a couple of million. Um, the challenge is, and this is, this is one of the challenges that I didn't get to, is that one of the things that I think that our region is missing is entrepreneurial spirit. Not, not like the farmers, I think, are, the, are the, the epitome of our entrepreneurial spirit in the region, but where do we find, if, if I had a $5 million fund here right now, 
there is not, I don't think that there's people that are, there's not enough entrepreneurial activity to be able to invest that in a, in a way that would actually have um, enough diversity and enough um, uh, inclusion. What's that? Inclusion. Inclusion, but you, you, you've got to, you've got to, in order to make that not the most high risk fund on the planet, you've got to have enough diversity across your investments that you that you can actually sustain that fund over time. And so, so I think that part of what we're missing prior to needing this big fund is the entrepreneurial drive of people saying, hey, I want to do this thing and the only thing I'm missing is the funding. And I don't think that that's where we're at. And that's part of, we started talking about this over the last few months really strongly. And, I, and I, that's the part that I started to see was missing is I don't think there's people beating down the doors looking for funding. So we need to build that entrepreneurial drive as the precursor to, to the community development fund. And, and that, and Rick may have a different perspective on that. Well, one, one exception to that, um, and Jason Fishbach would definitely like to talk to you. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, the Bayfield um, Food Cooperative uh, is experiencing amazing success now. We're beyond five years, we're beyond a million dollars, uh, we're 28 farms. Uh, we are not only uh, the barefoot farmer out of Northland College in their first year, we are, uh, in fact, to be a member, you have to have more than $10,000 in annual sales and demonstrate that to even join the cooperative. But the beauty of the cooperative, too, is that we've got long time uh, uh, businesses here related to food that are members of the cooperative. Boating Fishers, Hauser Superior View Farm. Um, uh, Norton, David Norton, uh, who has come back to take his father's farm and does uh, grass-fed beef. We've got real farmers and um, uh, folks that have more than got their feet wet uh, and are well on their way. So without going on too long, what's the need? We were just uh, this past year, we had to buy 10 acres of uh, the old uh, Ashland Experiment Station from the county. Now, we had to convince them to sell it to us. They, and it's again this thing about farmers. There's no opportunity in farmers. Dave, Dave uh, Kaczynski, the president of the board, locked horns with the county board and, and, and uh, with a PowerPoint presentation and a couple of farmers to back him up. Convince them with uh, with uh, with the numbers that it's going like that. Twenty eight farms. It's uh, organic valley started the same way. Multi million dollar cooperative now, largely small farm membership or medium farm membership. Uh, so that's happening right in our community. They just bought uh, this. Uh, uh, 10 acre parcel uh, has some open land, but mostly what we've been interested in it uh, are, is a complex of dilapidated buildings. One has already been completely renovated and is serving as our office. And now we're working on a big steel building that's going to be completely remodeled as a core, coal storage and aggregation center for our CSA project and program. And that's big money. And, and at our last annual meeting, the farmers were asked, uh, you know, uh, there was an obligatory uh, responsibility of each farm kicking in substantial money toward that. But I know that we've created uh, a, uh, an investment uh, uh, category for non-members that will pay uh, a return on that investment. So we're looking for community people to buy in and help us get to the next curve. Is that to say one thing more? Uh, That's the hardest thing. That's the hardest thing is to help the beginner transition to the next level. That's the tough one. And it's best done cooperatively. So if you can support the cooperatives, I think you're supporting the farm. I think that's an appropriate end point uh, since we've run out of time. Um, of course, this conversation will continue either in this room or down the road. Um, but it is 9.05 and we were supposed to end at 9. Uh, 
Um, I really want to thank uh, Sarah McKinley for making the trip out, and uh, I'm sure she'll 